Greetings, travelers. Greetings, travelers. Oh my gosh. Wow. What is what are we in? We're, We're in August. We are in we are in the middle of August. It's uh this is going to air on August 13th. So oh we goodness. have a couple events. Um, I'm gonna be at PopCon in Louisville, Kentucky, and you're gonna be at Tampa Bay Comic Con. Both are um the 23rd through the 25th of August, but we both have panels. Which is yeah. going to be weird for those having that experience because they get 0.5 of the Erie Travels team yeah. live and in person. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be speaking on uh, cryptids and legends of Northern Kentucky, and I'm going to be speaking on cryptids and legends of the Tampa Bay area. So, yeah, uh, we'll yes. be, uh, splitting our forces. Yes, but, which uh, is weird. So, um, I think today's episode is kind of fun and interesting, given the fact that I didn't even make it through the front gates of this place. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This, this one got you to the point where you wouldn't even walk in the door. No, was, no, uh, no. I was not prepared for it. And I have to say, you know, we were kind of like, hey, we could drive by this, blah, blah, blah. But no, 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 well, no. it was a stretch goal for the day. We were hitting a couple other locations that were must hits. And yeah. then we were like, oh, we're only going to be 15 minutes away. We were at the infamous Popelik Bridge just outside of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm like, oh, you know, we're only 15 minutes from here. I can give the uh, owners a call and see if we can come up and take a couple pictures of this location. And uh, as we were getting there and I was just about to make the call, you were like, nope, nope. Yeah, nope. now I opted out. So this is what I'm going to say. What is interesting is for our month of August, we're doing August Antiquities. So I think it's kind of the theme that we're going to a place like this. So late 19th century, early 20th century, there was this, well, in the 19th century, there was this huge boom in the treatment of the mentally ill. Now, we're, this is not actually what Waverly is, but we have to kind of tie this in. All right. Uh, we yeah. are going to Waverly Hills Sanitarium for those of you who haven't read the, the name of the episode. But we got to start a little bit before this. And okay. uh, what happened was there were all these advancements in treatments for the mentally ill in the United States. And state funding begins to come in to assist with this issue. Now, uh, activists, doctors, and all this are really pushing for humane treatments because up to this point remember the mentally ill were pretty much just locked away right and just yeah. you know, we don't want to deal with this and so there were new therapies coming around and there was this big push for public institutions to treat the newly diagnosed patients and since the money was now readily available uh these facilities would suddenly be were being built that would replace the old prisons or poor houses where they were basically abused and no needs were met or anything like that. So the guy who really comes up with the idea for the modern asylum system is a guy named Dr. Thomas Story Kirkbride. Okay. And he publishes a paper on asylum design and intended function. And these principles basically influence a huge construction boom and uh, of handling the many asylums that are going to be built throughout America. He felt the asylum itself was an important part of the treatment plan. He says, you know, we're going to build this, give them structured activities. We're going to give them seclusion from their illnesses. We're going to have some medical therapy as necessary. And we basically an overall improvement to the welfare and care of patients. And it will improve society as a whole, right? This is yeah. just going to be a really wonderful thing. And so he decide he builds them kind of in wings, which even most modern hospitals have the North Wing, South Wing, West Wing, East Wing. And a lot of people describe them as basically the wings of a bat, right? The way he describes them, which I think is appropriate. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that makes sense. So basically you have a central administration building yeah. And that also houses, you know, the staff and the care facilities and all that. And staff generally isn't expected to leave the property except on their weekends, right? They're going to stay here. That's why it's going to have rooms and board for the staff. And then the wings would stretch out from there. And then the female patients 
in one wing and the male patients in the other. And they would be then divided on how excited the patients were. I use quotation marks there, air quotes on our audio yeah. podcast. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so like the worst patients would be on the lower floors and the farthest from the center. And then the calmer patients would be on the upper floors and closer to the center. So imagine like the okay. drying. The I triangle feel like you're describing a triangle slash Christmas tree. So yeah, kind of, kind of. Yeah. It, it's that, uh, what was it from the uh, wonderful uh, How I Met Your Mother, the crazy hot scale? Oh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's like that, right? But the calmer and and nicer, right? Now, the big thing about these places was they were basically comfortable and productive. They were hoping that by doing this, they would keep other patients from antagonizing the calmer patients. They would be, you know, the, the, the crazy ones are farther, farther away from everybody else. Now, also, there were other things. You were going to get a lot of fresh air and natural light and well-tended grounds. Yeah. So that you would be calm. This is a beautiful place. This is... We're trying to reduce triggers here. I, I don't think they realized that was what they were doing, but that is what they were doing. Well, and I think the idea that, and that's been a long, you know, how part of therapy is a very calm nature environment where somebody is not being bombarded by things. And yes, they probably didn't understand triggers the way we do now, but definitely part of the process, right? And the Kirk Brides were built with farms. So this way the patients could help tend the gardens and the fields. It was basically helping themselves to be self-sufficient, but it was also supposed to be therapy for the, the patients, yeah. you know, to get out and about. They would also have some of them attend some of the other chores in the facility, like doing the laundry, doing some of the cooking, doing some of that. So it would be stimulating for the patients. And then you've got this calm and natural beauty around it. Yeah, And he promoted this. Kirk Bright himself was like, this is the way. This is how we're going to fix mental health in America. And as the 20th century dawned, it's already dying. there Because there is no permanently cured patients or, or very limited. And no reduction in the amount of patients being sent to these things. So the states suddenly say, this isn't working. And we're going to cut the funding. Now we start doing psychoanalysis. We start developing drug therapy. And asylums basically were quickly becoming obsolete. Very, very quickly. But, okay, now in the middle of all this, right, that's going on. The town of Louisville, Kentucky has a different problem. They are in the middle of what is known as the White Plague. Do you know what that is? Yes, I unfortunately do, which yes. is tuberculosis, correct? Tuberculosis, yes. So this is, again, late 19th, early 20th century. Same time, Kirkbride is promoting this as a wellness thing for mental health. Waverly Hills is being hit by this disease, right? The leading cause of death in most industrialized nations at this time. Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, I'm going to really horribly pronounce this because, uh, was it mycobacterium tuberculosis basically hits the pulmonary tract during the early stages of infection. And it causes, uh, you know, basically the nondescript stuff that we usually get fever, a malaise, you kind of get a, a phlegmy cough. But then as it starts getting into the bloodstream and it starts proliferating around the body, you get a lot more suffering, right? And victims in late stage tuberculosis start doing, you know, bloody stuff, getting coughed up, and they start becoming emaciated because their body is literally being eaten alive by the disease. It's, oh, wow. It's terrible. I, You know what I should say? I don't think I knew what tuberculosis actually did. I knew it was bad. I knew a lot of people could recognize it because people would cough up blood. Right. Yeah, that was the, the sign. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's when it's to the point where you are in serious trouble. Doc Holiday, right? Isn't that what oh, happened there? A lot of people. Yeah, they they would say consumption or other things like that because they would try to avoid saying the TB. Yeah. Uh, 
Don't love that. Uh, but uh, anyway, so Louisville was basically it was epidemic, right? They, yeah. they were saying uh twenty percent of the deaths in the city were attributed to the disease. Wow. Uh, at this time, you know, they've got stagnant air, they've got industrial pollution, overcrowded communities. It's just it's the perfect breeding ground for this uh right. bacteria. Now, Kentucky also at this point, very severe lack of public health funding. Now, tuberculosis awareness and uh, prevention starts becoming much more prevalent at this point because look, it's everywhere. 20% of the people are dying of this. So we've got to do something. So they look at that sanitarium movement that Kirkbride is promoting and they go, wait, fresh air is the perfect cure for tuberculosis. Oh. They think. Right, this is just which is a, not actually what ends up curing. Not at all what, what will help. And they're like, well, you know, natural environments, nutritious supplements, isolation, curative treatments. This is perfect. We're gonna separate the patients. We'll get them out of the towns. That'll help. So they start looking for a place to build a hospital. So they form an organization called the Board of Tuberculosis Hospital. Okay. And they basically purchased this land uh, that Major Thomas Hayes had, this sprawling estate outside of Louisville. His wife loved this area, so they had built this beautiful property out there. It's so funny because now it's considered like one of the scariest places on earth. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, this is... They build... They, they decide to take his land and they had called it Waverly based on a book series. And I'm trying to remember the name of the book right now, but they took the extra E out of it. Yeah, it was it, um, Walter Scott's Waverly novels. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. I knew You're it was. Welcome. Look at me I, knowing I, stuff. Look at you knowing a thing that I forgot. My brain was had left the train and I couldn't figure That's it okay. out. So. What? Nobody has realized yet is actually secretly siphoning off all the information from Mark's brain into a consortium. I'll get into that later. Continue okay. on. Beverly, uh, you, and the, you and the lizard people. All right. That's good to yes. know. I'm glad to know that it's going somewhere because it's it's leaving me. And that's why we're doing these podcasts. So I can get them out the door as fast as possible. All right. So, yeah, he had built that beautiful place. And uh, so 1908. They buy the land from them and begin construction of the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. They liked the name Waverly. They thought it was sounded very peaceful and tranquil instead of spooky. Well, I think <laughs> the initial, like literally the very beginning, we're all right in the world. We're at the beginning of the horror movie, Mark. So yes. everything is fine right now. Yes, and they build this beautiful building, give it its own zip code give it its own post office. They, they start building the farmlands. The doctors and other employees are being moved in and yeah. they are not allowed to leave the grounds because this isn't a, a mental ward. This is going to be a tuberculosis ward. So they are going to be constantly exposed to the infection themselves. So they're going to have to stay here too. Yeah. But they've built it so spacious that they'll be able to handle 400 which at the time sounded amazing. Like, yes. we're not going to get 400 people. Are yes. you crazy? I'm so glad it's so big. Yes, it's ginormous. So donations of money, land, the new hospital is started. It's epic. Now, 1910, it has been built and it does its thing for a while. The disease is still running rampant. And they decide we have to expand. So they start building a little more. And then they look to the Kirkbrides again and say, all right, we've got to do this. So by 1924, they expand and create what is now known as Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Yeah. Uh, tuberculosis yeah, Sanatorium. Now, the new structure opens in 1926. And it is considered the most advanced tuberculosis sanatorium in the country. Wow. And still at this point, though, most patients are dying from the disease because there's no medicine available to treat the disease. 
They're basically offered rest, fresh air, and food. Well, you know, um, I'm going to say, I hate to say this is very similar to a recent situation that happened in our country where yes. there wasn't a solution. They tried things, but there wasn't a solution right away. In case anyone's yeah. wondering if COVID was the first time we did this. No, 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 exactly. So they're put into these rooms, right? And they're given lots of rest and fresh air. And it didn't matter what time of year they still decided these people needed fresh air and needed to be opened up to the air of, of the mountains above Louisville. So there are these amazing photos of people sitting on the porches of these rooms covered in snow while they're fighting off bacterial infections and high fevers. <laughs> you know, I bet at times it felt good. I don't know that it was a bright idea, but I'm sure there were days it felt amazing. Basically, the main use of the hospital becomes a place to isolate those who come down with the disease and keep those away from family members who haven't got it. Yes. And the families were divided when they got there because, like, the parents, you know, the males were on one wing, the mothers were on the other wing, the children were even forced into their own wing. And um, the horror movie music enters the scene. scene. Yes. So there is definitely separation. And you basically are getting little contact with your loved ones. So now the music really begins. Because let's start talking about some of the treatments that were done here for tuberculosis. I want to put the caveat here because somebody said something to me the other day about a medical treatment. And I'm like, you've got to remember, we have so much stuff that allows us to do different options now than back then. There was a little bit of trial and error. Not that I'm saying it's great. I'm not condoning it, but we have to look at what it was like back then. And the fact was you didn't have some very basic things that we have now. Like there wasn't the little blood spinner thingy, right? Like a yeah, yeah. centrifuge. Yeah. Yeah. Like there wasn't some of these things that would allow you to study things better. So it was a trial by error, not condoning it again, but go ahead, Mark, and freak us all out what was happening. Okay, well, because they didn't know, right? Yeah. They were searching for a cure for this. So now we would go, oh my gosh, this is barbaric. But no, it, this was science. Patients' lungs were exposed to ultraviolet light to try to stop the spread of bacteria. They were like, so let's get them out in the sun. Oh, if we can't have sun, let's, uh, we had, they, they made these sun rooms using artificial light in place of sunlight. Again, taking the fresh air covered in snow. But then that's like the light. That's the, the basics. So here's where it gets crazy. So okay. balloons would be surgically implanted into the lungs and then filled with air to expand them so that you could get more oxygen. Yeah. Can you imagine no. some of the results of that? Yes. Well, I yeah. could imagine it blows up. Lungs are not balloons. Just in case no. anybody needs that little update, that's not what they look like on the inside. Yeah. Pop goes the weasel. Yes. Exactly. Unpleasant. All right. So then when that wasn't working, they're like, well, the lungs just need to get bigger. They need more room. Well, what's stopping them from expanding? Oh, the, those pesky ribs and those muscles around the lungs. Let's just take some of those out. Freaking terrifying. Yeah. So... They were allowed to allow the chest to expand more, right? So they'll get no. more oxygen. No, don't love that. Yeah, that was considered a last resort because most people didn't survive that operation. Imagine that. I would not think so, no. You're doing all these operations. You're doing all these things trying to help patients. People are dying in record numbers. It's not Black Death levels. This is still, as bad as this sounds, gang, we're still not, we're miles away from the uh, medieval times and all that. So, um, Which we'll do an episode on at we'll some point. We'll do an episode on the Black Death at some point. We've already talked about it a little bit about it. But yeah. so there are inaccurate reports about how many people died during Waverly Hills decades of operation. Okay. Some, there are stories that's like tens of thousands die within the halls. But the highest number we've got uh, one year was 152, and then in the 1950s, those numbers dropped down to like 40. 
something. There was a reboom of tuberculosis after World War II for these guys who came back and had had gotten it. But most of the soldiers who got that and were sent here didn't even last a week uh, because it, it was so bad. So uh, all in all, we think about 6,000 people died there going all the way back to the original hospital records from 1911. So that's yeah. a lot less than what modern reporting says, right? Modern reporting says, oh, there's tens of thousands died here. No, no, no. It's still a lot. Agreed. Yeah, that's still, for one structure, basically, you know, and a rebuilt structure, it's, yeah, that's that's a lot of deaths. Now, most everybody comes in through the front doors, right? Yeah. How do they get out of there? Well, to hide the numbers of deaths and all that, that's why reporting is tricky on this place they had a famous one of the most famous built facilities there is called the body chute yes an enclosed tunnel for the dead that led from the hospital to the railroad tracks at the bottom of the hill that was about where we parked that's where you were feeling that because the body is just basically lowered in secret to the trains and that way the patients wouldn't see any of the bodies leaving because the doctors believe mental health was just as important as physical health here to fight the disease. But yeah, they still broke up families and all that. But yeah. Well, <laughs> but. And I think, you know, it, it wasn't, here's the thing with this though. It wasn't built to do that. It wasn't built to like, they, they were not prepared that this was what was really going to unfold when this occurs. Right. So, I mean, as much as I'd like to say at the same time, how dangerous is it, unfortunately, having sometimes, you know, men around women and children and sometimes women around children. I mean, there's there's other layers that I don't want to even go down the dark. No, path. no, no, exactly. It, exactly. We'll, it's, we'll get it's to that. Hard, but at the same time, if Black Death taught us anything, hanging out with your family while you're sick, maybe is not the greatest plan either. Right, right. So... By the 1930s, tuberculosis was on the decline because new medicines were coming around and we were yes. figuring some stuff out. And then like again, 1943, it was pretty eradicated. But then that jump in cases, World War II. But again, they didn't last long. So it wasn't really an issue. Shortly after that, Waverly Hills is closed down. But in 1961, it's reopened as the Woodhaven Geriatric Sanitarium. Ooh. This is where it was going to be an old age home. Okay. It's, pretty. it's built on this beautiful land and, and all this. So here there were, again, some unusual things going on for an old folks home, right? There was lots uh. of ways of mistreatment and unusual experiments being done on the patients. Now, some of those are very inaccurate, just like the number of deaths there and all that. But unfortunately, some of it was true. Yikes. Oh my gosh. Okay. You know, uh, before we before we go there, I'm gonna I think we need to take a quick break because I'm okay. Already, and don't worry, I'm we've got a little more history to go and then we'll talk about the hauntings. Okay. Okay. We'll be right back. Greetings, travelers. It's Erica, one of your favorite co-hosts from Erie Travels. Don't tell Mark I said that. But I wanted to offer you a very unique opportunity. You can always advertise with us here at the Erie Travels podcast or on one of our live shows. If you're interested, you can email info at erietravels.com or go to our website, erietravels.com, and use the Contact Us form. We would love to hear about your great product and be able to share it with all of our travelers. And don't forget, as Mark always says, we'll see you on the other side. The sweltering heat of the Florida sun breaks as a chill runs down your spine. A dark shadow looms from a nearby tourist trap didn't expect to find this kind of shade in Florida. If only there was some sort of travel guide to steer you through the spookier locales. Well, you're in luck, reader. Join author Mark Muncy and Carrie Schultz as they lead you through the darkest locations in the Sunshine State 
in creepy Florida, available from History Press and at fine bookstores everywhere. And we're back. So now that we're getting to the really super gross stuff, go team. Well, we've already done the gross stuff, but this was still very, very dark and mysterious stuff. 1960s, it is now the Woodhaven Geriatric Sanatorium and electroshock therapy is thought to be highly effective. Oh my God. False rumors about this. And this is elderly. Yeah. Talk about elder abuse, right? And basically, they're using electroshock for a variety of ailments here. If uh, one of the patients was a little randy, you know, one of the old folks staying there still like to have sex, oh, shock him in the brain. Uh, If uh, some people there were having dementia or Alzheimer's, shock him in the brain. Let's see if we can get him working again. It's terrible. So the 60s and 70s, guess what happens? Budget starts getting cut and cut and cut. And so by the 70s, it's just horrible conditions, patient mistreatment, and it takes until 1982 before the facility is finally fully closed. So never officially an insane asylum, like many people say, right? It's like, it's not like the Trans Allegheny or some of the other Kirkbrides that yeah. were actually used for that, or like the ridges. Well, it's interesting because it, it was called a sanitarium, which I don't know if a lot of people realize. Sanitariums are for medical treatment. Yeah, it's people not sanity. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. That's what these were for. These were supposed to be healthy places. That's all. It was used for mental health as well as physical health. Oh, and that all went nuts, didn't it? Yeah, it sure did. So now the building basically changes hands quite a bit over the next couple decades. Famously, in 1983, a developer purchases it just literally a year after it was closed because he wants to turn it into a minimum security prison. But he gets basically shut down because neighboring businesses and stuff. Remember, when this was originally built, it was far away from town. But the town has expanded in those 80 years. And you saw, we drove right up behind apartment complexes to it. So it's yeah. literally right there now. Uh, so Places basically, I would never of, want to live there. Right. So basically, lack of funding stops that option. So it goes till 1996. And a man named Robert Alberhasky, who ran the Christ the Redeemer Foundation. So he decides he goes down to Rio de Janeiro. And sees that Christ the Redeemer statue. Yeah. And he decides he was so inspired by that, that he wants to build on the roof of the hospital at a cost of about $4 million. He's going to renovate the building and turn it into a chapel, a theater, a gift shop, and a place for missionaries to stay. And he's going to build the world's largest statue of Jesus Christ overlooking this town of Louisville. Oh, okay. So he needs $12 million, and he's going to start taking donations immediately. Oh, that's nice of him. That was very kind. All right. Just like everybody who starts a GoFundMe without a lot of uh, really good preparation, guess how much money he makes? Almost nothing. About (laughs) $3,000. Yes. Which, in relation to $12 million, is almost nothing. Is pretty much nothing. It's not enough to pay for the stationary to send out more requests for money. So it's pretty much canceled in 1997. Now he decides to kind of recoup some of his losses. He starts deciding he wants the buildings torn down. So that he can sell the land and redevelop it, right? Okay, that's an idea. Now he starts doing some demolition work around the southern edge of the building so that it will... Uh, undermine the structural foundation so that at least he can collect the insurance money on the property. But this scheme got caught and failed. So 2001 Waverly Hills was sold to Charlie and Tina Mattingly and they are the current owners of the property. And very cool. And what are they doing before we get into how creepy it is? Just let's talk about the building for a minute. So what have they done? 
Well, by the time they got it, basically time, the elements, vandalization, it was the local haunted house, right? This is the place you go, the big creepy hospital up on the hill. Millions have died there. Thousands have died there. You know, whatever. All, you know, the homeless looking for shelter, teenagers looking, you know, going looking for ghosts and whatever. And it just, it's got the reputation, right? And all this. So it's falling apart, right? The place is a disaster. And they start trying to do what they can with it. And immediately the thing they're figuring out is there's some odd stuff going on here. Yeah. They see a little girl running up and down the third floor. They see a little boy with a leather ball. Sometimes they see a hearse pull up to the door that isn't there, right? It just disappears as it drives up. At one point, they saw a lady with a bleeding wrist crying for help. And they call the you know the, the police, and then she's gone. Oh, see? Nope. Nope. Not on board for this. Yeah. So the legends start growing, right? And they start offering historical tours, but they realize everybody wants to see the ghosts. So they start using the money they're making from these tours to help shore up the building, keep it from falling apart. They want it to be declared a historical landmark to save it, but they also are a little afraid if they get too much historical landmark, they can't do much improvements to it. You have to, there's very specific things you can do with historical buildings. So it's a, it's a battle. What do you do? What do you don't do? And all that. In this place, I think a lot of people don't understand this place is huge. Mm. Like, it's not a tiny, yeah. like, it's, you know, there are some hospitals there as well. This is a 400 bed place. Oh, by this time, it was over a thousand beds. So, no, yes. I know, but I mean, it was built yeah. to be nice, spaced out, 400 bed, you know, thousand bed. Like, this mm. is not a tiny place to put humans. No, no, it's, um, uh, it's, it's crazy. So, the most, haunted room on the area i was gonna say is that the chute because i would think the chute the chute is probably the most famous right that's the one where people see a lot of orbs people see a lot of things man there were so many possible things that could be in that chute right yeah Uh, the most popular ghost there is timmy he's the little boy ghost who frequently interacts with toys the roll balls around the most yeah, active room that. yeah the most active room is room 502 okay. now this one is actually listed as a patient bathroom oh uh, what but the legend is that a 20 some year old nurse got impregnated by another abusive staff member remember they were all forced to stay here yeah and so she supposedly ended her own life hanging from somewhere in that room on the fifth floor okay Um, and then another report is a nurse threw herself off the balcony from this area Now, now it's not the same nurse supposedly the problem is there's no records of either of these things but this is, where did the rumor come from? It's just one of those ghost stories that happened in all those years of abandonment and all that. But that supposedly you see the swinging lady there and she looks like she's in a nurse. She's a lady in white. She looks like she's in a nurse costume. I think this is more tulpa. Than yeah. Anything. Okay. It's been, uh, something that's been intentionally created by the stories there. If any place in the world is going to have you know, something created by intention, it's going to be this place, right? Yeah. Now, there are tons of legends. There's a, a man in a white coat who's seen walking in the kitchen, and you'll smell cooking that kind oh, of walks okay. through the room, like cooked chicken and stuff like that. Uh, when I went there, the kitchen was basically broken windows, broken tables, I was there before it was famous. Right? I, I was there before it was cool to be there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I went in the early 2000s before the ghostly legends had kind of really taken off. I was there because I was a 
nerdy guy who liked history. So um, when did you go there? I went, oh goodness, when was it? Uh, or early 2000, 19, had to be 99 or 2000. Okay. Um, so that was over 20 years ago. Yeah, it was, it was a long time ago. And basically I was in town for a convention and one of my friends there knew the owners of Waverly. And so they let me go in with them to the place. And there had been no television shows at this point, no books, no websites dedicated to it, right? And it was a dark and stormy night when I went. (laughs) (laughs) So I I didn't care. I wanted to see the place. I didn't care what the weather was. I was like, I want to see, I'm convinced there's something. I mean, this place, when you drive up to it, it's freaking creepy, right? It is an impressive structure and all that. And you know me, I have a little sensitivity to things, but not nearly the levels of some of these mediums we've talked to and stuff like that. But I had at this point already traveled a lot and been to infamous places. I'd been to Dracula's Castle. I'd been to Pavaria. I'd been to a lot of strange places, but I'd never been to Waverly. And so to me, I was like, this is no different. just a historical building with, with some ghostly encounters and all this. And, and, you know, the legend hauntings, I'm in. I'm all in, right? This is this is perfect. So met the owners. They were super nice. And they let us explore. And they told us a few places we couldn't go. And my friend was had worked with them. So he knew the safe areas to visit and stuff like that. He knew some places we wouldn't be allowed to go. And once you're in there, all you hear is your own footsteps. That has and, and to I be hear, so weird. I could hear the rain, you know, as it's dripping through wherever the holes are. And, and splashing down onto the floor. And I was given a guided tour by the three of them. We went to the treatment areas. We went to the morgue and on and on, the kitchen, all these other things. And we climbed up the stairs and I went to room 502. What is in room okay. 502? And when I'm up there, I'm seeing the town of Louisville and it's pretty amazing. This is that bathroom, right? And it's supposedly oh, the bathroom, yes. Things, right. And I could see the lights of the city like reflecting on the storm clouds. It was very, very cool. I didn't see anything in that room. I was like, okay. I didn't feel anything weird in that room. I didn't think anything. But I noticed we didn't get to go on the fourth floor. And I was like, why are we not going on the fourth floor? And they were just like, we're saving that for you. It's not the safest floor. And but we so we're gonna have we had to go up this one way and then we're gonna go down and into the fourth floor on the other side. So I I could get that feeling that they were keeping something from me, right? Okay. And we get to the fourth floor, and it's just as ramshackle, broken down as the rest of it. But I got that feeling. Something not right here. And it felt I felt the tangible presence. It's not good. Eerie, eerie things. I'm like, this is an eerie travel, right? This was the the, the thought of it, had I known. So we were basically at the center of the building. And there was a wing. I was told, this is not safe. Don't go in here. Sections of the floor are missing. It's off limits. It still is off limits as far as I know. I haven't been back in a while, so I'm, I'm excited to go back. But my friend and I, we both basically hear sounds of doors slamming in that part of the building that's closed off where there is no floor and all this. I'm like, well, is it the storm? You know, is it blowing the wind blowing through? But I realized the wind is just this light wind. Now the storm has passed and it's just this little light breeze. And I'm like, I don't know if that's slamming these heavy doors that it sounds like. And so I asked them, the owners, I was like, who is there anybody up here? And they're like, we should be the only people on the property. It's guarded. It's protected. Sometimes some homeless people try to get up here, but there's no way they got up into that area. So that was when I was like, okay. Uh, so got my flashlight. <laughs> I'm like, all right, this is, remember, this is before cell phones gag. And all yeah. So didn't, you know, you didn't use your cell phone as a flashlight. If you did, you were using the front screen of your flip phone and that's not really very bright, <laughs> but um, anyway, that's when 
I was like, there's no one around here. Can't be anybody walking through there. And we go into the porch area that's kind of outside. This is where the patients were taken to get their fresh air, right? So there's no glass anywhere. So the interior is just open to the elements. And with those clouds, Louisville and everything, it's just dark and murky. And I'm seeing shadows everywhere. And I'm convinced it's a trick of the light, right? That the shadows yeah. of the clouds and the city and all this. And then I just kind of look over in a corner and I'm like, okay, there's somebody there. And it was uh, my experience with a shadow figure. Oh my gosh. I looked at that and it was just impossible to miss. It was a shadowy figure just standing in the middle of the hallway in front of us. And he crosses the lighted doorway and passes into the hall. And then poof, gone. I'm, I'm still getting goosebumps from this. So I knew it was a man. He was wearing like, could have been a doctor's coat. It was definitely like a drape form. And it only lasted a second. Gone yeah, before. I have goosebumps now. I don't like any of this. Nope. And it hit me. It hit me hard. I'm like, what? You know, I've seen other things in my life. I'd seen some crazy things, but this was... I was like, we need to get in there. What what was that? And so my friend and I, we go in the room and we're shining flashlights everywhere and empty room. He was gone. There was nothing. And then immediately that feeling left of the presence. Wow. For me, that was enough. That's that's where I'm like, okay, yeah, this is... And yet you want to go back. Longer. Well, yeah, because... I want to see some of the other ghosts that are supposed to be there and all this. So that ghost now is referred to as the creeper because he's been seen on that fourth floor many times oh, and wow. shadowy figure. Sometimes he's seen crawling on the roof. Sometimes he's seen crawling on the ground, but he generally tends to stand in the middle of the hallway and then vanish a few steps later. So, I don't like any of that. Yeah, so you can go visit for any of those other ghosts. That's the one that gets me. Wow. And, you know, I'm all about the cosplay ghosts, but you just got to wonder, with that much suffering and death, you know, it's got to create an easy portal. Yeah. I mean, you're you're talking about where, you know, we talk about those areas where the, the veil is thin or where these triangles that we're discovering and and things like in our books where we're, you know, conjunctions of ley lines and all that. Yes, that stuff is still all speculative. It's still, sci you know, pseudoscience. And, but it tends to all make sense when you start looking at it and stuff like that. And that, that area, people like, oh, room 502, 502. I was like, eh, <laughs> 502 wasn't anything for me. It was that fourth floor. Oh my God. That well, crazy. And the other thing is, like, you weren't expecting, so this, these are my, I mean, I hate to say it, but these are more my favorite kind of situations where you're not expecting it. They didn't go, hey, when you go on this floor, there's going to be this creepy, because I feel like once you are anticipating something occurring, then there's a lot, much more likelihood that whatever intentions you have on seeing it, whatever these things are, preternaturally go... Oh, they want to see a swinging body. I can do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or or your brain says, okay, yeah, this is this is gonna happen. This is what I've been told. I'd heard about the little kid and all that. Yeah. So I was expecting him. I never saw him. It's so weird. Well, they and... also don't come on command, right? Like that's the, here's the thing. If you have a ghost that right. shows up on exactly. command. It is probably not a ghost. Right. That's that's something else. We went to the tunnel and it, you know, there there are all kinds of weird stories. You know, they, they, when he was there, they were telling me 60,000 people died here. And I'm like, and now I know probably closer to six. It, but even if you'd split the difference and put it like 8,000 or so somewhere, it's still, that's a lot of people going through that long tunnel. But I didn't, it just was a spooky tunnel. And I think that's kind of where it gets its its lore, right? Yeah, they they now have a haunted house there on those first couple floors. 
Yeah. That I know is certainly helping to build things, right? The song up on the roof is where the children were given their, their therapy and supposedly you can hear Ring Around the Rosie and other things. And the, the white man is there. It's not a lady in white. It's a doctor in white. Uh, he's seen up there. Also, supposedly up in that area, you can smell baking bread for some reason. It's probably because they were giving the kids pastries and things like that. Uh, that's where the lady with the bloody wrists is seen, is up on the top floor. Okay. Um, there are often lights seen in the building, like flashlights and stuff, but nobody's supposed to be in there at the time and all that going I on. I don't love any of these things, so I'm going to hard pass. Yeah. And there are tons of just invisible forces, EVPs, and other things like that. Now, my thing with a lot of that is it's the big building. And when they yeah. do tours, they tend to have several groups. So it's not like when I went there where there was just four of us in this giant built. So, yes, you will hear echoes. You will hear footsteps. That's why you want to stay connected with other teams that you're there. Definitely don't go there alone. Oh, my gosh. When I went, I was with the owners and my friend who well, had you can't even go there alone and if you do you're trespassing so right. if you want a super private tour i'm sure you could reach out to the owner they do, and have, those. Yeah, they do have those available yeah a pretty penny and go do that yeah and it's not that expensive compared to some of these other haunt, haunted locations i'm using air quotes there that are yeah. turning it into a cottage industry waverly is doing what one of our other favorite asylums trans allegheny is doing where they use the money from these tours to help restore parts of the building. Now, Trans Allegheny, they're just structurally saving it, right? There's no way they're going to be able to save this building and restore it to as beautiful as it was back in the day. That that would cost untold millions. It would be almost impossible to do. But they are a protected site, thankfully, still. So it's not going to get bulldozed down anytime soon. Oh, that's um, good. That's good. And you can get a private party together and do an overnight. I will not be participating in that. I draw the line. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I'm going to do a quick little bit on the end of the Kirkbrides, right? Okay. Because what happened was our good friend, Geraldo Rivera. Remember him? Oh, I do. I do. Yeah. Now he went into a couple of those, the ones up in Long Island. Remember the Cropsey? episode yes. we did and he saw how badly these places were were treating people right trans allegheny was probably the most overcrowded penhurst is another you know infamous asylum and we're going to be going by there when we do squonk which will be before we air this episode we'll have already been there so hopefully we get to drive by that uh the ridges which was uh, one of the longest running ones that ran from 1874 to 1993. And that wow. one's just like Athens, Ohio. It was known as the Athens lunatic asylum. It's infamous because it held an exorcism once for a 14 year old girl who was suffering from epilepsy and her ghost supposedly haunts that place. Uh, but we'll talk about these and other things. Uh, Trans Alleghenies in Weston, West Virginia, and it's a hugely popular spot for paranormal investigators. But Waverly is on the bucket list for almost everybody. But the Kirkbrides pretty much all shut down when the Ridges was the last one. That was 1993. Now, mental health care in America needs help, right? In, in the world, it still needs help. It's still not diagnosed. Tuberculosis still kills thousands of people around the world even though we do have vaccines and cures. So it's just because some areas can't get the help they need. And, and they're not getting it checked soon enough to, because yep. by the time you're coughing up blood, it's uh, done. It's yeah, done. Yeah, not much more that can be done. Do. Yeah. yeah. So that's when you start feeling those cold symptoms, not saying anything, but get yourself checked. Take a, yeah, take a please. test. It's okay. TB is easy to be checked for. And uh, for those soldiers around the world and family members of soldiers around the world, when they do those TB techs, yes, let them. Yes. <laughs> it's important. We don't need this coming back. And we've already got cases of the plague and 
in Colorado again. We don't need tuberculosis coming back any stretch. Agreed. So travel for today, Mark. Is Waverly Hills. You can go to Louisville. You can book yourself a ghost tour. You can even spend the night there now. They have uh, overnights. But you can only visit when you've made a reservation. Going there without a reservation is trespassing and against the law. All right? And you might be the next ghost there if you do that. Because there are still unsafe places that you could get hurt. And nobody will be able to come look for you because you went there when nobody knew you were there. Or you might even get shot. Who knows? It's just bad. Don't do it. Yeah, don't go. Please, we're going to include the link. Go on their website. Sign up for a legitimate tour. Maybe wait till you go travel around the spooky holidays that are coming up. And you can see the haunted house, which I'm sure is even more terrifying. I would say go during October, September, October. They have the haunted house. And even first weeks in November. They do a haunted attraction there. It is open mostly weekends. Incredible to be in a haunted location, screaming your heads off as people jump out at you, but you might find an extra ghost or two jumping out at you as well. So um, don't you always if there say is that a fear you're monger right? there? Yeah, I will oh. not be surprised. Oh my gosh! Yes, I vote. Ah, oh, I got goosebumps again. I yep. vote yes. Well, I will stop by during the day, I guess. But Mark, this has been terrifying and we had fun, but then terrifying again. So why don't you take us away, my friend? All right, gang. Thank you all so much for joining us on this tour of uh, my memories of one of my most haunted locations visiting and also a tour of a place that I think is on most paranormal hunters bucket lists. Ignore the legends. Try to find the history underneath. It was not a lunatic asylum, but it is still a very scary place. It was a lot of people died here. A lot of history did happen here, but it was trying to be a good place. It just didn't work out so much, but that's what all these places go for. You know, we, we, we try our best and sometimes history takes a turn that we didn't realize, but that's what this is all about. This is the practice of medicine. So it's the practice of medicine. We've got to practice, make it better. But with all that said, when you're heading out in those Hills of Louisville, you go up to Waverly Hills, take a deep breath, experience the beauty of the place, the awe-inspiringness of it. And when you go up those floors, think about the people who've been here, the lives lost, the family tragedies and all that. Take a moment of solace. Watch for the ghosts. Keep your eyes open. And when you get to the fourth floor, beware of the creeper. And we will see you on the other side.